Uh, if you have your Bible, we're going to turn to the book of uh, Hosea this morning. So if you know where Isaiah is, turn right and go through Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and he, get Daniel. If you find Daniel, you're almost there. Turn to the right and you'll find Hosea. Is that good? I don't want you flumming, flum, fumbling through while I'm up here trying to preach, right? I don't want you to stop in Ezekiel and say, well, I'm just going to stop here. And I think that this is one of those scriptures, if, if you would, I really would love for you to, to look at it in your copy of God's Word because I want you to uh, reference this from time to time. As the Lord leads, I want you to reference it. And uh, I want to got to share a message last night for the graduation of those who uh, went through Victory Home for six months. And uh, Chris was part of that. And uh, grateful for uh, what God's done in his life and what God's doing in his life. That just remember that in all of our lives, it is an, an active work. It's an active work. What God does in our life doesn't stop. You're never going to reach a... If you reach a plateau, you're in the wrong place. If you've reached a plateau, the next thing that comes is decline. Is that good? But yet, the plateau is where most of us choose to be or want to be. So um, the God that we serve is a God of, that changes not. He's the God of yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, matter of fact, Malachi 3, 6 says, For I am the Lord, I do not change. Everything that God does flows from the nature of who He is. He cannot do anything. He cannot say anything. His actions toward us cannot be anything other than that which flows from the nature that He's a good God, that He's a powerful God, that He's a loving God, and He wants to do great and mighty things. Those laws of God are fixed. They're fixed. Matter of fact, even the unbelievers understand that we have a God over this universe who puts those things in place for us. Matter of fact, uh, the founders of our country, uh, not all were believers, made huge statements about what they called natural law, that which just flows to every human being. They didn't really realize that it was coming from God. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson was not a true believer. He, he actually had a Bible. That He went through the Bible, and everything that seemed uh, difficult or, uh, well, let's just say it, that had the hand of God on it or was a miracle, he just tore that page out. Matter of fact, if you can, you can find a Jefferson Bible, it won't have the virgin verse, it won't have the miracles, it won't have the death. Of Jesus Christ he won't have the resurrection of Jesus Christ it, it, all those things he just took out so we're not call, talking about great believers but yet Jefferson said these words to us we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It doesn't say happiness, it says the pursuit of happiness. But basically he is saying, because our Creator loves us, He gave us rights. Those are the things that come from the laws of God. They don't change. Though, matter of fact, what we seek to do is we try to adjust our unnatural ways to God's natural ways. And we do them all the time. Work is followed by reward. You don't get the reward first, though our government's trying to change that up, I think, a little bit. You work first, and then you get the reward. You love, and because you love, you give. That just naturally flows. If you're loving, you're going to be giving. Otherwise, you're just making it about yourself when you're not giving. That's just the natural flow. Giving flows from love. Grace brings mercy. That God bestows upon us what we do not deserve, 
And because of that, we do for others what they don't deserve. That's where mercy is. Mercy is where God doesn't give us what we deserve. He gives us better. Mercy follows grace. They're hand in hand. You can't just say, I want the grace of God, but I'm going to judge others, and I'm going to condemn others when they don't meet my expectations, and I'll be unforgiving to others. Unless you, matter of fact, doesn't Matthew say in chapter 5 verse 7 blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy you got to give mercy to get mercy it flows it's the laws of God they're fixed and one that we know very well is we reap what we sow whatever you sow whatever seeds you sow that's the crop that you're going to produce that's a fixed law you plant tomatoes, guess what you're going to get? Rick, a beautiful summer tomato. Not one of those that comes from the, from the, the greenhouses in Florida that just don't taste right. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I mean, one of those, you go out back in the house and you pick one of those things and you go in and wash it up a little bit, slice up that thing, slather on some mayonnaise on a, on a piece of bread, and put some salt and pepper on it, and heaven came down and glory filled your soul. Amen? I mean, just the blessings that come. When you sow something, you do it with an expectation that something's going to come from it. That's a fixed law. Now, you can fight that, and you can gripe about that, but you're not going to change that. You might not like the law of gravity, Right? And you may say, no, I can, I, I, I'm better than the law of gravity. You can get up on top of this building and, and you can say, I'm going to defy the law of gravity and you can just step right off. You're not going to break the law of gravity. You're going to break your neck. But you're not going to break the law of gravity, right? Because those things are fixed. One of the reasons why I love the Old Testament is God gives us graphic pictures there that show us the nature of God. And there are things that creep into our life that are against God's natural laws. And we need to see it. Come on, church. We need to see it in God's perspective from His eyes. We need to examine our own life because we're not going to change God. But we should want God to change us. We need to move from where we are to where we need to be. So if you have your Bible, I've given you plenty of time to find the book of Hosea. Stand with me in honor of greeting God's Word. I said this in the first service last week. I read these two verses and it's just been in my heart all week because really, I preach to you out of the overflow, but God's been preaching this to me all week. Matter of fact, this morning uh, on, on the on the drive-in uh, to church today, God was still just going over this in my own life, and I was thinking about really some things that I I've been dealing with my whole life as, as long as I can remember, and I, I'm still claiming the name of Jesus over all of those areas. Look in Hosea chapter ten, verse eleven, Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain. But I harness her fair neck that I may... Uh, I, harness, I harness her fair neck. I will make Ephraim to pull a plow. Judah shall plow. Jacob shall break his clods. We'll make that verse sound a little better in just a moment. Here is the money verse. Here's the verse that will bring treasures to your life. Sow for yourself righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray that right now that You will share the message with us like You did with Hosea for the people of Judah in that day. 
because you loved Judah, you loved Ephraim, and you wanted them to be close to you, to hear you, to walk with you, to be a blessing to you and to a blessing to their family and to all the people around them. Father, we live in a society that is living in, and, and, and going in deficit. And yet we hold the treasures of the universe within our heart. And Lord, do not, we pray that we would not live below your grace, but we would accept your grace. We would uh, make it a part of our lives and in any area. And Lord, we know that there are areas that the things that do not honor you creep in. Lord, as we begin this year, speak to us so that we could have the blessed, glorious, fruitful life that you called us into and that, Lord, that we could, we could live the way you created us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Would you be seated? Sowing and reaping. Galatians, Paul says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man sows, that he will also reap. If you think otherwise, you're deceived. You're self-deceived. God's not going to say, All right, you just do it however you want to. You can break my natural laws and I'll come in and I'll bless you anyway. That's not what God does. That's not what He does. So we allow God to do a, a great work. Sometimes I believe we need to, when I study God's Word, sometimes I look at it and I want to go from the end forward. Actually, you go backward to go forward. And, and look what it says in verse 12, at the end of verse 12. It is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on you. Church, God wants to bless you. Do not accept anything else. God wants to bountifully pour out His love, His mercy, His grace, His goodness, His righteousness on you. On you. Did you hear that? personally god's eyes are fixed on you in love god wants to do an amazing mighty work in you some of you may have walked with him for a lot of years and in that process you've you've kind of intertwined in and out of the blessings of god but i'm here to tell you god has said i will bless but he also says, there's some things that I have to do. You have to do so that I can bless. He says in verse 12, sow righteousness. Sow the seeds of righteousness. And by the way, something will come from that. Reap in mercy. And then he says, break up your fallow ground. God will not pour blessings Holy Spirit, let this hit the hearts. God will not pour forth His best on fallow ground. Jeremiah 3, excuse me, Jeremiah 4, He says, break up your fallow ground, sow not your seeds among the thorns. If we keep doing the things that are against the ways of God, but expecting God to bless God's not going to do it. So what is the fallow ground? It's an area that at one time was productive. It's an area where people had put forth effort and prepared it and, and planted a crop, and it was productive. It was great. It was glorious. Great reaping great harvests but yet somehow because it wasn't paid attention to and 
it was just left alone that it began to grow up. Weeds began to grow. Isn't it funny you don't ever have to plant weeds? I mean, you'd think you'd have to plant weeds, wouldn't you? But they just come up. And briars and thorns and bushes. Trees will grow up. Why? Because it was just left alone. No attention was given to it. Come on, here's the word. It was neglected. My great-great-grandfather, in the early 1800s, had hundreds and hundreds, close to a thousand acres of family land. And a lot of the land, and this was in northeast Georgia, south Stevens County. Now, they had to come in and cut down trees. Not tree, trees. And they had to get rid of the, the stumps. And by the way, they didn't have bulldozers. Y'all hear me? To, to cut a tree down was with an ax. To have to remove the tree was a difficult process but getting rid of those stumps and if anybody knows anything about northeast georgia when you start to to try to break up the ground there's rocks everywhere i mean god planted the the seeds of rocks in northeast georgia when i was a kid and i used to play on that land i used to wonder why there was all these rock walls and, and the and the land was terraced off they were just taking them out of the ground and had to put them someplace, and they just made a, a rock wall there, you know? And they were everywhere. And I was a little kid and just playing about it, playing there, and didn't think much of it. My great grandfather, born in 1848, now I know some of y'all got great grandchildren. I'm Margaret, bless your heart. You're not the only one here, but get to play with not only the grandchildren you get to play with great grandchildren my great grandfather was born in 1848 and he worked that land that my great great grandfather had started it and then there was this thing called the civil war that happened and afterwards they did what they could with the land and he was older and tired but he worked hard my grandfather was born my grandfather was born in 1875 my grandfather do the math in your head he's old right 146 if he were alive my grandfather worked with my great-grandfather and they used it well but my grandfather got married and he wanted a farm of his own and went up the road a little bit to a place called Avalon I mean it's an unincorporated they don't even have a stop sign I mean, well, they may have a stop sign, but they don't have a blinking light. You just travel on through, right? And he worked his own farm there. And my, the old home place just kind of went back to fallow ground again. Then when the Depression hit, they, you know, farmers in that day, you take your money and you put it in the bank. Well, the bank closed, and they took his money. And then the one that he was buying the farm from they called the loan so they took his money and they called the loan and he had nothing so he decided to move back to the home place there in east denali and all that ground had grown up again that he used to work when he was a kid and he had to break up the fallow ground all over again and he worked the land and it was productive until the mid 50s and then Nobody really wanted to do anything there. And it laid dormant again and became fallow ground again. My dad decided that he wanted to retire <laughs> and move back to that area. And he moved back and put a house up on the old home place there. And guess what? He had to do that work all over again. Of course, he had an 18-year-old boy that kind of helped him out a little bit. I think they call that slavery in some states. I don't know. but 
And if you went to that place today, you would see trees that are 50 foot tall. Matter of fact, the only thing that would resemble a place where once was great harvest is those old rock walls around the side. You see, we tend to work hard on something and then we tend to leave it alone. There are areas in our life where we're looking for a breakthrough and a blessing from God and we sow the seeds of belief. We sow the seeds of trust. We sow the seeds of love. We sow the seeds of of obedience. I can't tell you how important that word is. Being actively obedient in your life and God pours out righteousness and blessing and goodness. And then, for whatever reason, whatever reason, We kind of leave it alone. Neglect comes in like a thief in the night. And it's like the enemy goes in and starts planting weeds and thorns and briars and bushes and trees. And because there's not active cultivation, it becomes fallow ground. So what do you have to do to create fallow ground? Not a thing. You don't have to do a thing. If you want a dirty house, you don't have to go get a wheelbarrow of dirt and just scatter the dirt through your house. What do you have to do? Just nothing. You want a broken child, you don't have to take that child and put them on your lap and teach them dirty words and teach them bad manners. Just neglect them and watch what happens. You want to see a broken marriage? When one starts neglecting the other and what God joined together, what happens? It'll fall apart. Follow ground. For no fault of anyone in this building the last two years have been hard last two years have been difficult this is not the same church it was two years ago look around two services people ask me or how long we're going to be in two services and i don't know i don't know i I promise you i've asked others what they think I told you that I want you to be wise. We need to follow our heart. They tell us that this thing that hit us 22 months ago is still here. We've had church members this past week that have been tested with COVID and and found themselves that they did have COVID. They didn't just get tested, they had COVID. And last week, our numbers were the lowest they've been. In quite some time. Maybe it was because it was January 2nd. Maybe it was because of the fear of COVID. I don't know. I'll take some responsibility for this. I guess I have to. As Truman said, the buck stops here. I understand that. But yet there's some things in our church that over the last couple of years have probably been neglected fallow ground has set forth matter of fact forsake not the assembling of ourself together it hadn't always been that people couldn't come but a lot have not come back last week we had almost as many people watch I don't know how many people watched us online I can't tell that All I can tell is how many people log in to watch us online. It could be on a phone. It could be on their computer or their their iPad. It could be on their smart TV. I don't know. It could have been one person watching. It could have been three people watching. I, I can't tell that. But we had almost as many people, five short, of those that logged in to watch us online 
as we're in the building. Now, this is not a sermon on trying to get people back. This is a sermon that God's Word says God will not pour out His blessings on fallow ground. There's just areas in our life that we have allowed to be neglected. Maybe we spent a lot of time and energy cutting trees, pulling up stumps, getting out the rocks, taking the, 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 the ox or the, or the, the um, cow and putting them on the yoke and putting them out there and letting them break up the clods and letting them break it up and get the soil ready. Maybe we we spent a lot of time and effort and energy and planting those seeds and, and, and protecting those seeds and weeding out all the things that could come in. You know, Matthew 13, Jesus gave us the parable of the one who went out to sow the seeds but it fell on four types of soil. One had been hard panned, hard soil, over many years of neglect. One had no depth. One had weeds growing in it. And in that parable, 75% of the hearts that the seed fell on, the seed could not bring forth good crop because you don't, God does not bless the seed planted in such places. But the one with the good soul, God did only just bless, but 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Listen to me, church. That is a fixed law of God reaping what you sow is a fixed law of God so look what it says here look in verse 11 Ephraim is a trained heifer that loves to thresh grain he's speaking about the children he's speaking about the people of Israel like an old cow I mean that's not a very flattering word to be called a heifer and you put the yoke on them, and in the threshing floor, they would, they would put the piece of wood there, and, and what the cow would do is go in circles again and again and again. And they would take the corn or the wheat or whatever, and it would, with the grinding stones, it would grind them up. And it took no effort for the cow. He just walked in circles. Lived his life walking in circles just ease if he got hungry he just bent down got some food matter of fact deuteronomy says do not muzzle the ox matter of fact that's quoted twice in the new testament speaking that you're supposed to that those that are giving themselves to the ministry of the word of god you're supposed to let them profit from the the ministry of the word of god too but he's basically saying don't muzzle the ox they, they would just sit there and go around in circles and and do the same thing over and over again no effort whatsoever they just ate whenever they wanted to they got fatted and he says this is what we've done we have found our come on now we found ourselves in the routine. Praise God for you that came this morning. Amen. Praise God for you to come. But I know that even coming to church can be a habit. It's a good habit. But if you're not careful, even those that come can come in the routine and miss the blessing in thereof. And there are others who neglect coming to the house of God. And come on now, that's just as much a habit. And it can develop into a routine. And God called us to sow seeds of righteousness. And it may take effort, but God will bless that. Right, and this is not talking about the righteousness that God imputes upon us. It's talking about doing the right things. Choosing, come on, obedience now. Making effort into, not neglecting. Looking at all those areas of your life. Maybe we need to pause and just take a walk through the acreage of our life and look there. We definitely need to as a church. 
and it's going to be hard. It always is to break up the fallow ground. We're not going to do it with comfort. But it's the right thing to do. So, those seeds of obedience, believing, trusting, obeying, and reap in mercy. God will not give you what you deserve. He'll give you better. But it begins by not neglecting. Look what it says in verse 12. For it is time to seek the Lord till He comes and rains righteousness on us. It's time. But you know what the Word of God really means there? I, I, I double dog dare you to study this. You'll love it. You'll absolutely love it. Do any of y'all ever hear, hear this phrase? It's high time. It's high time. When I was a kid, I was supposed to clean my room. I mean, that was a law of the Stevens family. And you better not break that law, right? So one Saturday morning, I wanted to do something. So I came out, and I, I, so I could get permission to go do something. I said, I cleaned my room. You know what I heard? Well, it's high time. It's a time of necessity. It's high time. That's exactly what this is saying. How long? Till he comes, pours out blessing. How long? How many of you want to see a blessing left to the people of New Holland and to the community? It's going to take effort. But God created us to work. It's going to take faith. But the only way we can please God is by faith. It's going to take trusting in the hand of God that if we do what, we're, what He asks us to do, that He'll bring forth the crop. I really wonder if we're ready to do that in our personal life. I really wonder if we're ready to take an inventory. Or are we just okay with just staying on that routine of going in a circle, not much effort whatsoever, following the routine, eating whenever we want to? I'm preaching this this morning because the Lord's been preaching it to my heart all week. May we not sin the sin of neglect. Not in spiritual things. It's too important. 